Once upon a glass of salter, I was the parliamentary spokesman uh, for angling, sort of mini minister, uh, in uh, the governments of both Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. Uh, I'm basically a fisherman who accidentally found himself in politics. Um, but what I did do is I helped launch, as you can see in the second point there, the Angling Trust. That is the peak body for angling in the UK. Uh, I've got the scars on my back on how hard, how hard it was to herd the cats to get all the warring factions together. But we eventually did it in the UK and they've done it in many other places. So what you are seeking to strive has been achieved elsewhere. So lesson number one, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You have to find what works and apply it to the New Zealand context. Yeah. It ought not to be hard, frankly, friends, in your country. You have got fantastic coastline. You're at the end of the planet here. You've got, you're an intelligent, sophisticated society. There's only four million of you. You ought to be able to make it work here, probably better than almost anywhere else on the planet. And here is one of the great ironies. I mean, this morning we heard a lot of people talking about the problems. Politicians identified themselves as both the solution and the problem and then got out of it by throwing the challenge back to you. And perhaps we're trying to give you some ideas for solutions. But one of the best models of governance that I came up with in the work I did for the Aussies, who are in a right mess, was here. It's New Zealand, fish and game. Talk to anyone around the world. One of the greatest and best models of governance for recreational fishery. It's actually sitting there. Not the man himself, probably is the man himself, but the model, a public entity, a license funded. I'll use the L word, I'll use the L word to, to the cows, Come on, don't, don't apologise for having a license, don't apologise for having a stream of revenue, don't apologise for having money and power and influence and being able to deliver for the people that love your sport, don't apologise for that or run away from it. You know, do it, embrace the opportunity, but make sure the funding is ring-fenced and doesn't disappear into the government's coffers, that's the key, that's the absolute key. So, I put this report together for the Aussies, I didn't mean to, I got sucked into the kind of internecine warfare that was going on, and my report was called, eventually, Keep Australia Fishing. I wrote my own brief, um, which is always easier, so formulate a range of policy demands, the basis of a recreational fishing manifesto that could be put to politicians. I tell you about politicians, I was one for 25 years, okay? Politicians are really interested in you on the run-up to an election. After that, you can be a bit of a pain, all right? <laughs> The people that win in any battle are the people that set the agenda. Stop hanging around waiting for the crumbs to fall off the table. Yeah. Write your own manifestos. We have done that in Britain. The process we used in Britain, it's another slide but I'll save time by telling you now. The process started in Britain when the Labour Party had a bit of an image problem, uh, recreational fishers formed a huge part of the kind of core demographic of, of Labour voters. And this is where I find it strange that Australian Labour voters got itself in such a mess. You know, huge uh, amounts of working people, you know, loved their recreational fishing. And, 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 and when a political party gets divorced from its base, it gets into problems. Part of my job was to reconnect with that base. So I wrote with the governing bodies of the sport, the disparate governing bodies of the sport, Labour's charter for, for, for angling. It, it went down very well. I was standing down for Parliament at the last election in 2010. I'd done 25 years, I'd done, done my shift, I wanted to go fishing. I didn't want the political parties to have a charter war. I thought, hang on, we're now sophisticated enough, we're now organised enough to write our own manifesto. So what we did is we wrote a manifesto for recreational fishing and we ran it at the three political parties in Britain. They all signed up. And so if there was a group of people less concerned about the outcome of the 2010 election in Britain, it was a recreational angling sector. Because we got it there, we got it locked in. That's where you've got to get to. That's, that's the clever place to be for your sport. Whoever wins the election, you win. That's good. Develop a public narrative. I'll come on to that in a minute. I've got facts and figures. You've got a real problem here. You can't identify what you are worth to the New Zealand economy. This is key stage one stuff. And the Americans have got it right, they really have. Repositioning on environmental issues. I think it's really good Greenpeace are in the room. I give money to Greenpeace. You can't be a member of Greenpeace, by the way, because sometimes you guys do illegal things, and that's good too sometimes. Um, but I think, you know, everything we do is dependent on having good quality environment, good stewardship of the environment. <coughs> and whilst there are things we would disagree with, 
There's actually a lot more we have in common. I, I take great exception with the attitude of some of the environmental groups to marine reserves and the rest of it, and I think they quote selective science. But we have a huge amount on which we agree, and we are much more powerful, as Bryce said, where we find those areas of common ground and can move forward. Better communication and engagement, improved accountability. I've come up with structures for the Aussies. If, if, if they go with it, great. And again, that was looking around the world, looking at the models, and licensing plays a big part of that. And then, as I said, drawing on best practice from elsewhere. Looked at America, looked at Britain, which I obviously know. Holland and Norway, very interesting models. New Zealand fishing game, not the marine side, I'm afraid. You, you know your issues, but certainly your, your freshwater side. OK, so I then started thinking, what do we need to secure a, a better future for recreational fishing? Well, you know, it's about the fish, is what Len said. We spend so much time talking about each other. It's about the bloody fish. It's about water quality, it's about habitat. We certainly need strong political support. We need strong public support. We need to think about our image, you know? Is it always a good thing for us to be hanging out pictures of dead fish all over the place, you know? Perhaps we should be equally uh, aware of uh, the projects we do that encourage young people to get into fishing. When dear old Thatcher shut the mines in Britain, we had resilient communities that were pit communities. Once the mines closed, we ended up with 80% unemployment in some of those villages. A lot of those kids became heroin addicts, or had alcohol problems and all the rest of it. And do you know the one project that diverted more kids away from drugs and crime than anything else? That was projects that got kids into fishing. Now, it may be because it taught them patience, because it takes such a long time to catch a fish in England. But whatever it was, it worked. And I tell you, not, I tell you now, we levered millions of pounds of Home Office funding into angling projects in Britain on the basis of the social contribution that our sport can make. So it's not just about bloodlust, it's not just about going out for a feed, it's not just about playing with animals. It's a whole bigger lifestyle thing than that, and it's a big lifestyle thing here in New Zealand. I know that's why I came here fishing for a month. Reliable funding and professional advocacy. Grant, I really liked your presentation. Uh, you know, you've got to be professional in this, this, this age of communication. You can't do this stuff as gifted amateurs anymore. Not if you're going to buy space in the media, not if you're going to get the public attention and you don't get the politicians' attention until you get public attention. Clear policies and vision, and then anglers engaged in the future of their sport. We know about the level of engagement. Rand has said, what, what was it, 97% 90, of anglers in New Zealand are not engaged in clubs or societies. It's very different in Britain. And that's because I have to join a club to access fishing. Your fishing is gloriously free here, or access to it. I mean, you, you buy a license to fish and, and to support the work of fishing game, that's great. Your access to the water is free. For us, it's different because we're riparian rights and entirely different structure. So our angler governing body gets 350,000 members through its clubs alone. Uh, so you're never really going to get a structure, either in Australia or New Zealand, where people are going to join clubs and you'll build your mass membership organisation that way. You have to look at other ways, and that's what I've, I've sought to do. <coughs> I might have just nipped past the point I wanted to make. Sorry. Healthy fishing. No, we're fine. Fine. Sorry. So, yeah, it's all about the fish. Now, we'll argue with the green groups about marine reserves and the rest of it. And you can buy any science you want. We know that, Len knows that. We can buy reports commissioned by the commercial sector sometimes that say there are no problem with fish stocks, and we can buy alarmist reports commissioned by some of the environmental groups saying that there's no fish left or the last fish is about to be eaten. I tend to look at the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, and I have great respect. Uh, they're basically saying that 80% uh, of the world's fish species are either fully exploited, not that 80%, about 50% hit the fully exploited. So fish to the maximum amount, 30% are overexploited, in, in serious trouble. And we know something <laughs> about ourselves. But look, at, this is the big figure. We know that the 20% of the world's oceans that are in a better place are more likely to be in this part of the planet, okay? They're certainly not in the North Atlantic, they're certainly not in the Mediterranean, they're certainly not off China or Korea. But we do know that the global population is going to be rising from 6.5 billion to nearly 10 billion. And we know there's going to be massive pressure on resources. So we can't get away from that argument. What we need, yes, of course, marine reserves will play a part in that, but we also need sustainable and effective fisheries management. When I come back to the license issue, we know we have to manage the resource. We know the 19th century concept of the inexhaustible ocean and this abstract right to fish it is for the birds. It's gone. 
We gave that abstract right away when we signed international conventions, when we <coughs> accepted the need to manage our resource. Once you give that right away, it's not actually a huge intellectual leap to work out that in order to manage it sustainably, it needs money and it needs professionalism. And that a licensed income is actually part of that. Fish and Game couldn't operate on volunteers alone. They have a fantastic volunteer base. And you, couldn't volunteer, you couldn't operate without that. So, it is about being professional. Not just in our advocacy, but the way we manage our resource. I look at the Australian fishery, I think New Zealand fishery is quite similar. It's better managed than many in the world. <coughs> it's not without its problems. We have problems with Malawi. You, you share the problems with southern blue, blue and tuna. I find it amazing that third world countries like Panama and Costa Rica have got rid of long lining. And we've still got it in this part of the world. Long lining, for God's sake. And I'll come on to the economic value of, uh, of individual game species uh, in a moment. So, plenty that could be done to improve the situation. Here's an interesting one. I always use this when we're arguing with the, uh, some of the green groups on uh, marine reserves. We sold the recreational fishing licence, I say we, my predecessors, sold the recreational fishing licence in New South Wales, which is the first state to introduce it, on the back of bringing in recreational fishing havens. So they took out the commercial fishing effort in places that really were not particularly suited to commercial fishing effort. They were saltwater lakes, they were estuaries, the sort of places that are recruitment grounds, nursery grounds for, for our fish species. You, you could... But the difference between having solely recreational, managed recreational effort in these havens and having the commercial fishery in these havens was chalk and cheese. Fish stocks on the St George's Basin and, and, and in most of those recreational fishing havens in New South Wales have gone through the roof. Because by and large the guys that fish it are responsible, by and large they stick to the bag limit. Uh, they're not taking spawning stock, or uh, they're, they're not affecting the spawning stock, they're not affecting the biodiversity. It's a managed, sensible fishery. So we can prove that you don't need marine lockouts to necessarily improve a fishery. We have the existing tools to do it, and we've got chapter and verse in New South Wales as to how it works. But in terms of selling the licence, which is the big challenge for you guys, the way we got it through, and the Aussies don't like our licences any more than anyone else, but the way we got it through is you'll get access to some prime fishing grounds as a result of paying for this, this buyout of the commercial effort. And of course it's got better than that. They've got their artificial reefs, they've got better boat ramps, uh, more, more money going into research. And if it was organised properly in Australia, they'd use the licence, a small amount of the licence fee, to fund their representative bodies in the same way that New Zealand Fishing Game operates. This one's interesting. I make the Aussies feel good about how many of them go fishing. We've got about 3 million anglers in the UK, a population of 64 million. The Aussies have got about 3 million, a population of 24 million. You guys, you take the biscuit. Mm -hmm. What, it's about 4 million of you? Yeah. So you're saying 1.2 million? Yeah. Well, I reckon you win. <laughs> I reckon it's probably a country in the world uh, where, 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 where recreational fishing is so popular. So why the hell aren't you better organised? You should be asking yourself that question. <laughs>